all of a sudden the world started waking up. So wait a minute, somebody has been telling very big lies about Africa. There's huge potential. In Nigeria, 30 million customers, 20 million customers in less than four years. And this, this has woken up everybody really. And which is the only place where there's a shortage of fiber, it is Africa. The only thing that is causing that is policy and regulation. Now, if we're talking about research and education networking, we must be careful to distinguish between it and the general commercial internet, because that are two different worlds. In research and education networking, we want dedicated capacity going to education and research institutions at the lowest possible price. Like any other institutions in Rwanda, we have a problem of bandwidth. We have to pay ISPs, which the charge was much, and even when you pay for it, sometimes you don't get what you pay for. You know people are extremely sharp. It is just that they, they lack the facilities, and given the facilities, people can take off. So if you look at the commercial cables, it looks like Africa is part of it. But how much of that capacity is for research and education networking? In real terms, this means that we cannot exchange research traffic with our institutions. We must go over the commercial internet so we don't get the benefit of the dedicated research networks and low cost. That's why it's absolutely vital for the universities of Africa to get the kind of bandwidth that they need so that data sources from Africa can be accessed by the world and so that Africa can access these data sources uh, from other parts of the world. If we don't do that, our researchers will, be, will simply continue to migrate to where the data is. They will not stay in Africa. Wontonet started, in fact it was in essence triggered by the possibility that the East African submarine fiber system was going to come in place. There was myself, Tusu, from Uganda, Duncan from South Africa, Margaret from Malawi, and we realized unless we were to deliver money through the fiber, that we were really not going to achieve the amount and quality of bandwidth for universities to be able to conduct their research and participate in the global education arena. The situation in our country is because we get bandwidth through VSATs is that we pay $18,000 a month for that, so it makes it equivalent to a domestic residence in Europe or North America where they would be paying perhaps $30 for what we're paying, $18,000. So the rationale, one of the rationales is a financial one to get fair price. And therefore we came up with the concept of consolidating bandwidth. And that's why it starts, that we get together as educational institutions and procure from one entity so that volume can reduce the price. A contiguous mass of countries from South Africa up to Sudan, all with a legal framework to work together to lobby, to train their people to get affordable connectivity and efficient management of connectivity and research resources for development of their research and education institutions and ultimately development of our countries. And then on the other side you have got the Association of African Universities which brings together the vice chancellors across the entire Africa and which has really become a very powerful lobby for getting things done. This example, uh, if it can be replicated in other parts of Africa, uh, will also contribute uh, significantly uh, in the establishment process of research and education networks in Africa. We have been talking about a common architecture. Who can get this going at the policy level? It is AAU. And once it is accepted at that level, we can take over and define the engineering side of it. One of the challenges on the continent is the shortage of people with cutting edge engineering expertise. We are generating a lot of people in the IT field, in the electrical engineering field, but not enough people who really bring the focused skills of good network engineers. AFNOG is to an extent a progression of how the internet came to Africa. The principal limiting factor in the introduction of internet in Africa was the capacity of institutions and of uh, professionals. Uh, I'm lining up to get some books for ref reference material for most of what we've been doing at the workshop. I'm sure the folks at home are looking forward to this. We provide an environment where the key professionals are present. I've come to teach the students about email servers and in particular about the Exim email server that I developed at, at Cambridge. Like you meet the real people 
Mm, yeah, you used to read about the, the books, authors of the books, like, yeah. Phil Hazel, give you the real stuff, got and the way they break Cisco it down. Feel. Every challenge that you face in the field, on the life system. On the life system. You know, the database is supposed to be served on a network. The more I understand a lot of network issues, the better it is for me to administer my database. Now we are going to change all uh, addresses before. No, the addresses will remain, okay. but the setup will change. Okay. To grow, to run internet, just, just as simple as that, you need those identifiers, you need those IP addresses. And we are talking now about the exhaustion of the protocol we are using today, which is IPv4. So we don't want to wait to be in an urgency uh, situation before start looking at that. So what we are trying to do now is to give them the knowledge, to give them how to plan it, so they can start now. There are many resource, uh, human resources within AFNOC and AFRINIC that the universities uh, can use in building capacity. Without that technical expertise then there can be no network because working with fibre is pretty complex. So the three make a very smart partnership, I think, AFNOG, EU and Ubuntu Net Alliance. We believe eventually, actually sooner than later, we would have a Pan-African network because they're just going out like spider's waves. And once they connect, we've got the network. And then if into that we feed the international links, then we are part of the world. Where people are interested, they can become a very powerful lobby for change because who does the research? We do the research. And I think it is happening well with a long, long way to go, but the, the goodwill is there. We'd, we'd never have to, we don't struggle about who's doing what or anything. We just get down to business when we meet, you know, how do we deal with this? How, you know, how can this one learn more about that? So it's a very, I think it's a very positive thing. And, Endlessly optimistic. Thank you.